What's crack? Big dogs. Welcome. Welcome. Point to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas. And that felt good. I haven't done an intro in a while. Yeah, so listen, we've done a lot of rookie content. And I also asked you guys in a video last week what you want to see going forward because you've been super heavy on just like rookie and dynasty focused stuff for the last couple months. And I think we prepared you pretty well for your rookie drafts and hopefully they went well. I know a lot of y'all still have your rookie drafts over the next couple weeks in the next couple months, whatever, into the summer. So we'll keep throwing some rookie stuff at you. And today's video will be a rookie video as well, but it's a little more focused on redraft season long like what's going to happen right now it's cute and it's fun to talk about these rookies incoming for the next five years and be like my team just got a cornerstone franchise wide receiver for the next 10 years you mean it's fucking me making fun of myself i guess it's fucking drake london is going to be our cornerstone wide receiver for the next 10 years fuck anybody who says differently drake london the goat we're talking about rookies that I expect to explode in year one. Should be nice, tight, concise. We're going to go off some real numbers. We're going to go off some real facts. Guess what? Believe it or not, it's good to be practical about rookies because it also tells you where their value is going to jump up from year to year, okay? So you could draft a guy, and he could not do shit in year one, and his value could skyrocket into year two, or vice versa. And it's important to know those situations going in so you know where to value these guys in season long and rookie drafts, trading for them in dynasty, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what today's video is going to cover. That's all I got. So let's tuck our shirts in. Stop yelling. Let us eat. <laughs> If y'all are looking for a fucked up community to talk about fantasy football and anything BDGE related with, uh, we opened our Discord to the public, all right? So if if you haven't hopped in a fantasy Discord, if you haven't hopped in a dynasty Discord, you're looking to join a, a dynasty league, right? I know you're fucking hyped up and, and rocked up about dynasty, and you probably can't find a fucking league to join. This is where you can do that, all right? But make sure you're, you're going in there for the right reasons to, to engage and hang out and post pictures of margaritas. For those of y'all that are in there and posting pictures of the margaritas in the Marg Only channel, you have to leave a fucking rating and a location. We need the pin drop. Don't just be throwing in pictures of pink margaritas with no context. It's not what that's for, okay? So go in there with the right mindset, the right attitude, the right fucking energy. You're getting DOS boot. Discord, link down below in the description, top of the comments. Join the, join the BDG Discord. Let's get fucking rocking, baby. So we'll start off with the two outer positions. We have quarterbacks and tight ends. I don't necessarily think there's anyone ready to explode in those two positions, right? The earliest tight end picked was Trey McBride. He's still going to be sitting behind Zach Ertz in year one. So we'll make this quick. We'll make it simple. Ain't no tight end exploding in year one. Quarterback position, the only one who's walking into, and you could argue he's probably not walking into the starting job, Kenny Pickett, the only quarterback to go within the first two rounds of the NFL draft, 20th overall to the Pittsburgh Steelers, who obviously signed Mitch Trubisky this offseason. A lot of y'all think Mitch is going to start the majority of the games. I don't think that's the case. I think, I don't know if Kenny Pickett wins the job outright, but I would be shocked if Mitch Trubisky starts more games than Kenny Pickett this year. But you don't you don't draft a 25-year-old quarterback who's got 32 years of college experience, all right? His brain's got to be huge at this point. His brain's either got to be literally nothing or huge at this point. Regardless, you draft him because you think he's ready to play. Most pro-ready guy in the class was into a great situation. Statistically speaking, he's not a huge rushing upside guy. I think he does add some rushing ability that most people are kind of like overlooking. But that's not going to be his strong suit right at the gate. I think he's draftable in super flex leagues. I don't want to depend on him as my QB two by any stretch of the imagination, even if he wins the starting job outright. So not ready for him to explode, not ready for a tight end to explode. We can talk about the running backs, but again, most of them didn't get draft capital. So I don't expect them to come out the gate absolutely ripping. And for the rest of the video, when it comes to running backs and wide receivers, what we're going to do is throw their over-unders on the screen as per prize picks. So prize picks has these lines up in which you can go you know, play on right now. You can go gamble on these over-unders for these players because they have the statistics up there for you. And if it's your first time on prize picks, 
Use the promo code BDGE. They're going to double your deposit, okay? So if you want to go hit up Brees Hall's number and Kenneth Walker's number together, you parlay them up over Brees Hall under Kenneth Walker. Deposit 10 bucks. They're going to give you 20 bucks to play with if you use the promo code BDGE. And we're going to win some money at the end of the year. You come bike, rake the wallet up, thicken it up, and we're going to be feeling good. So we look at the first two off the board, right? And the only ones that are really, really heavily worth mentioning when it comes to fantasy Brees hall kenneth walker we have Brees hall's over under set at 650.5 rushing yards they only have the rushing yards on prize picks right now they don't have total yards or receiving yards they will start to add those props as we get closer to the season Brees hall man that's like 38 yards per game okay 38 rushing yards per game we are smashing that fucking over uh this is a backfield that is ripe for the taking an improved offensive line I think Brees Hall, I, listen, I think he'll probably be in a little bit more committee than we're letting on in terms of like how hyped up we are for him. Overall, long term, he's so young and he's on an ascending offense, which is why he's a premier dynasty asset. Year one, I do think there will be a committee that Michael Carter sees the lion's share of receiving work, receptions and targets out of the backfield. Don't think that is going to hurt Brees Hall in any sense of being fantasy usable. Brees Hall is going to be, I would say, Real projection for year one, he'll finish somewhere between RB15 and RB20, I think, okay? At the end of the day, it's still the Jets, and we still need to be seeing them operate as a good offense. We still need to make sure Zach Wilson's taking the right step up because if he's just shit, then this offense is going to run like shit, and that means you're getting possibly a two-down guy in a shit offense. He can catch the ball. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying he is a two-down guy, but I think at the beginning of his career, he might be subjected to goal line work and two down work with a little bit of pass catching work in between. So this is only rushing yardage, 650. Okay. So I'm smashing the over again. That's 38 yards per game. Like I'm pretty sure Tevin Coleman in the six games he played last year averaged over there. Brees Hall over 38 yards per game. They have Kenneth Walker's line at 550.5 rushing yards per game. Now we have Rashad Penny there. We have Chris Carson there. I'm airing on this. Chris Carson, I would be shocked if he played 16 games. I'd be shocked if he played fucking six games this year. The neck injury is real. They have to be extremely cautious with the way that they put him back on the field. I know they like to talk about how he's the starter when he's healthy, but the when he's healthy stick right now is one of the very few times in fantasy football where you actually have to be very cautious, where there's actual science telling you that the injury that he had is very dangerous to continue to play on. So I look at Rashad Penny as way more of a hurdle to Kenneth Walker getting on the field than Chris Carson, but either way, it's not good, right? Both of them being in the mix, one or the other needing to be on the field in order just to force this into a committee. Walker's not going to play on third downs. The fact that Pete Carroll already came out and has a little bit of negative energy towards the fact that he he can't commit to Kenneth Walker playing on third downs tells you everything you need to know because Pete Carroll is the biggest lion ass motherfucker when it comes to being an optimist about all his players. He thinks everybody can be a three down workhorse. He think the, he according to him, no one's ever missed training. No one's ever going to miss training camp. No one's ever going to miss OTAs. Everyone's 100% fully healthy by OTAs as per April, May, and June, okay? As soon as OTAs hits, oh, they're not healthy, but they're going to be 100% healthy by training camp. When training camp hits and they're not on the field, they will be 100%. That's that's the gist that PCAL gives off year over 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 year. So if there's ever negative sentiment coming out of his mouth, I don't mean negative like he's saying Kenneth Walker's a bad player, but if it's more negative towards the fantasy section, which he's saying he probably won't be a third down back, you can fucking write that shit in stone. Kenneth Walker won't be the third down back there in Seattle, okay? And uh, we dropped this stat a couple weeks ago when I was looking at Kenneth Walker, and one of the reasons I'm very hesitant to buy into him, especially for redraft this year, he's going to be one of those like fifth, sixth round players that we hype up every year that gets drafted in this in the second round of the NFL draft. The J.K. Dobbins, the Cam Akers, the DeAndre Swifts, the Javante Williams, the Miles Sanders. Like the list goes on and on and on of guys that we love their talent, but we just are so fucking impractical with how real NFL teams use them that they don't do anything until week 13 of their rookie year, making them a bad fifth, sixth round pick. That's what Kenneth Walker is going to end up being over the entire Pete Carroll tenure, which was like 12 years or some shit, we've only seen the lead rusher of one of their offenses. Whoever's the RB1 there, whoever's a leading rush attempt guy in a Pete Carroll offense, which is a very big sample size, the most receptions any of those guys has ever gotten is 37. It's all downhill from there. So regardless, not really anything to do with the rushing yardage projection for him at 550, but just an overall sentiment to Kenneth Walker ceiling not being very high in 2022 fantasy football. So I'm actually going to hit the under on this one. We have Brees Hall. We have Kenneth Walker. I have over on Brees Hall. I have under on Kenneth Walker. We're going to throw 35 bucks on it to win 105 
on prize picks. Again, promo code BDGE will get you a 100% deposit match. It also gets you access to our rookie draft guide, which is live on BDGE.co right now. You can get access via prize picks or on the website. The other running backs, we had James Cook go off. He's, I mean, this is clear as fucking day. His upside is that of a, you know, an RB3 in PPR leagues where he's catching four to five passes a game. He's not going to get a lot of rushing work. He's not going to get a lot of goal line work. Um, And it's crazy because, like, Buffalo was number three in points per game last year. 29.8 points per game they scored. Number three in the NFL. A total of 12 running back goal line carries. 12. There were 12 individual players in the NFL that had that many or more goal line carries. You're talking about the third highest scoring offense a total of 12 running back goal line carries. And you think the 199-pound James Cook is going to be involved in that in any sort of fucking fa- fashion manner? No. Now when Devin Singletary, Zach Moth or Moss are both bigger, Josh Allen taking fucking 13 goal line carries himself? No, 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 no. So James Cook could be like a cute little flex play maybe in full PPR leagues. I'm off that. I think the more, most realistic immediate impact player would be Isaiah Spiller outside of the obvious guys. He goes into L.A. as a fourth rounder. He will get that early down work immediately and probably get a lot of goal line work. That's another top five scoring offense that's going to see a lot of scoring opportunities. I don't think they want to use Eckler at the goal line. I really, really, really don't. So I could see Spiller being a flex play immediately. He's a guy that I will draft in fantasy leagues and redraft leagues immediately. Uh, They only have lines up for Brees Hall and Kenneth Walker right now as it is relevant to rookie running backs for prize picks. So these guys, I'm just talking more fantasy Sheesh. So Spiller um, is a guy that I think could break out. If Eckler misses time, I would be surprised if Spiller does not actually have, you know, two to three weeks this year where he operates as the workhorse. So people who love Spiller might back into getting their asses saved because of the landing spot. But we really like Spiller. I think two underrated other ones that could end up somehow getting work, or at least like if the guy in front of them gets injured, Brian Robinson who I think will get work off the rip. I don't think he's that talented, and I think that's a real committee there between him, Gibson, and J.D. McKissick. But if Gibson gets hurt, which he was hurt for most of last year with that turf toe, I don't, you know, like that was something that bothered him two years ago, went into this year. Like, I don't know what his his deal is health-wise. He gets hurt. Brian Robinson's probably going to have a very big workload. Third-round capital says so. Ron Vera's already coming out and saying so. I think Hassan Haskins has a low-key chance to be, like, very useful in fantasy if Derrick Henry were to get hurt as well. So I, I kind of see him as like a direct handcuff where, again, he's not a player that I really like either. He's a dude that just lowers his head and just dis- deletes people, just flattens th- their asses on the field. But he's like the least creative runner of all time. Doesn't make guys miss. Like it's not fast, very fucking slow. But he can thrive in Tennessee's offense if Derrick Henry's out of the way. So that's like a very stupid fucking blanket statement to say. But those are guys I could see having an impact year one probably miss one or two dudes if i did drop them in the comments and i'll fucking yell at you down there while you're down there hit the thumbs up button subscribe all that good sheesh and go hit the discord right real quick when you go down there you'll hit the link and you can come back to the youtube app afterward but go in there say what up to everybody and then come back watch the rest of the video because we're moving on to the wide receivers so for the wide receivers we're going to go a little bit more in depth here because they have about eight offerings on prize picks when it comes to the wide receivers receiving yards for their rookie year we have Drake London, Garrett Wilson, Traylon Burks, Chris Olave, Christian Watson, Jahan Dotson, Sky Moore, and George Pickens. All of them have receiving yardage lines on prize picks available to hit on the over-under. The lowest of the of the bunch are Watson, Dotson, Watson, Dotson, and Pickens. Fucking hell of a law firm right there. Six six hundred and fifty point five receiving yards. That's the lowest on the list. The highest is Traylon Burks up at eight fifty point five. So anywhere between six fifty and eight fifty is basically where these receivers are pegged at for receiving yardage and you know you might look at it and say something like why is sky Moore all the way up at 800 when garrett wilson's down at 725 better draft capital better player or like drake london better player maybe better draft capital may you think more opportunity things like that so what i want to do here is be fucking practical because a lot of the times what happens especially in the gambling world is a lot a lot of times why people lose is because they don't look at numbers that matter they don't especially like over under things like that they don't look at like pace of play how many offensive plays are run you know, it's like, oh, Sky Moore is not that much better than Christian Watson. I'm going to hit the over on Watson, but I'm going to hit the under on Sky Moore. You don't look at how many pass attempts a team actually attempts, how many targets are departed from the offense, et cetera. So we put together this chart that will help us kind of explore the real opportunity here for these teams, okay? And starting from Mr. Drake London, basically this chart has um, the player, obviously, the team they're on. The third column is pass attempts per game last year and then the rank in the nfl so for instance drake london the atlanta falcons attempted 33.7 passes per game last year which was 19th in the nfl 
pass rate, 60.93%. So the percentage of their plays that were passes as opposed to runs, eighth highest in the NFL. So what that tells you is there's a little bit of discrepancy, right? Their pass rate is higher. They wanted to pass the ball more than they wanted to run the ball, but they just didn't have the ball enough, right? Their pass attempts being at 19th tells you that, you know, it, I mean, it adds up. The Atlanta Falcons defense was trash last year. The other team had the ball a lot last year, so we didn't have the volume in order to get that pass attempt number up. It tells you if our offense or our defense gets a little bit better, we can expect more pass attempts because the pass rate is going to be higher under Arthur Smith. The next column is departed targets. So you look at Calvin Ridley, Russell Gage, Taji Sharp. Those are their target totals from last year. We add those up. That means the Falcons are missing 183 targets from last year. Divide that by 17, the 10.8 targets per game. Okay. Then the furthermost column is added weapons. So outside of the obvious rookie all the way on the left, Drake London, we added Autumn Tate and we added Damian Williams. So we want to get a total picture of like, what direction the offense is going, who they're leaving behind, what weapons they're opening up, um, and then any added weapons that are actually going to make an impact. So for me, I'm looking at Drake London, and Drake London's prize pick number is at 775. That is not the highest on there. It's not even the second highest on there. Burks and Sky Moore are both above Drake London in terms of passing yards per game. What I'm seeing on this line when we're looking at the numbers, again, is that our pass rate is high. And it might be, again, because we're trailing, so we are throwing the ball more. But I also think the pass attempts uh, per game were lower because we didn't have the ball enough. Our defense was bad. Our defense is going to be much better this year. We also don't have a running game. We didn't have a running game last year, but now you get rid of Mike Davis. We have a fifth-round rookie. Regardless of what you think about Algier, like a fifth-round rookie is not going to be the thing that moves the needle with our running game. So we are going to have to pass the ball a lot. That is going to be a pass rate heavy team. We lose a shitload of targets. Ridley, Gage, Sharp, all gone out of there, which tells me Drake London's target totals are not only going to come from earning the targets, but extra departed targets are like an automatic thing for him. The only thing we added was Auden Tate. So Drake London, I think, has a sneaky chance to, I mean, this is not a fucking hot take at all, not a sneaky chance whatsoever, but a very, very good chance to lead the rookie wide receiver pack in receiving yards. And I think 775 is a fair number, obviously, because there's always a little bit of a juice towards the under because we don't project for injuries. We don't project for just random things like that occurring. So I like the over a lot on Drake London's receiving yards 775 because there's going to be so much opportunity there. With the Jets, the Jets are similar to the Falcons. It seems like their passing rate is even higher. They have the third highest pass rate in the NFL. 13th most pass attempts per game it's similar in the sense that like they were always losing always trailing which means they need to pass the ball a lot but also when you're that high on the spectrum to the pass rate of being the third highest team in the nfl like that speaks a little bit more to just like the overall philosophy of the offense of course they're going to want to run the ball a little bit more look at departed targets jameson crowder's out of there keelan cole is out of there 122 total targets 7.1 per game that's not that many okay now they're getting back Corey Davis. They added two tight ends in Tyler Conklin, CJ Ozoma, Jeremy Ruckert as well, a rookie tight end. Don't expect him to really make an impact right away. But we're adding some weapons. We lost some weapons. Not a huge overall impact in terms of like volume, but Brees Hall again added to the mix. So I think they go a little bit more run heavy here. So Garrett Wilson is competing with Elijah Moore. He's competing with Corey Davis. His prize picks number is at 725.5. It seems like an easy number to hit. It seems like an overall low number. I'm a little bit more skeptical on it just because I think people betting on Garrett Wilson to hit that over are, it's strictly a talent thing. Like if you looked at it objectively, like if your least favorite receiver went to the New York Jets in this situation, you'd be like, fuck, not a great landing spot. Unknown quarterback, a lot of good weapons already there. Don't like it. But since it's Garrett Wilson, you're going to kind of wipe that out of your mind. I, th I don't think a lot of people are going to be objective about it. So I think that's a really good pick for prize picks at 725. Probably a line that I would stay away from. And to be completely honest, if I had to choose one way or another to lean, I think I would take the under on that. We move to Traylon Burks. Now, notoriously, Tennessee is obviously an extremely fucking run-heavy team. And I don't think that's going to change with A.J. Brown um, out of there. They were 26th in pass attempts per game, 31.1. Their pass rate was 31st. They have been a bottom three pass rate team in the NFL for three to four years straight now. Now, departed targets, A.J. Brown, Julio, Josh Reynolds, Chester Rogers, Marcus Johnson. That's 228 total targets departed, 17 per game. They do bring in Robert Woods, who's coming off the ACL. 
Austin Hooper also brought in. He's uh, He is what he is at this point. But Traylon Burks comes into an obvious, very high-level opportunity. My concern here is, of course, just the run-heavy nature of this team. I also don't know how good this offense is going to be. So 850 on him seems a little bit high. I do think he'll be very usable for redraft, but I, uh, I'm, I'm worried about who he is a little bit as a player and him being a little bit more boomer bust or inconsistent, volatile week to week where it's like, yes, he's awesome in times where he's making these sports center top 10 highlight plays. And then other times he kind of just disappears in the same sense that AJ Brown did that for the first couple of years of his career. Remember how inconsistent AJ Brown was putting up like 30 yards, 30 yards, 140 yards that, but even more so, because I don't think Traylon Burks is, anywhere near as good as A.J. Brown is as like an actual route runner. So Traylon Burks makes me a little bit nervous. I think that over under being the highest of all the rookies is one that, again, if I had to lean one way, I would take the under on Traylon Burks, 850.5 receiving yards as a rookie. Christopher Olave. This is an interesting one as well. He goes to the Saints who were 30th in pass attempts per game, 29.6 pass attempts per game. So a bottom three team in terms of passing volume, a bottom three team in terms of pass rate also, 51.47% pass rate. A lot of that, of course, is going to have to do with Taysom Hill being the quarterback for a while, so the rushing rate is going to go sky high with him under center. So that will swing back a little bit with Jameis Winston under center. Still don't know if they want to just fucking unleash Jameis Winston. Like, that's usually never a good thing. Ty Montgomery, Kenny Stills, little Jordan Humphrey, Chris Hogan gone. That's only 75 targets. So th- this this is the big problem with Chris, Christopher Olave. Really talented guy. I think he's going to be a really, really good NFL player off the rip. Only 75 departed targets. That is 4.4 per game. And they didn't have Michael Thomas last year. So Michael Thomas is added back to the mix with almost nobody departed on a run-heavy team. So if you look at the numbers, you look at the plain analytics, and you try to be objective about it, 725.5 for Alave. Again, might seem low, but that's going to be a, a, a tough hurdle to leap unless he's getting a huge share of the targets here in a run heavy offense with Michael Thomas coming bike. So that's one that I guess I would listen. I, I think usually you're profitable hitting the unders on a lot of fucking gambling props, a lot of player props, which is what prize picks spe- their specialty is, is all about hitting the under man. So that's how you profit. That's how you win. That's why, how I think a lot of these rookie receiver props are going to end up profiting. It is by hitting the under, okay? So, like, listen, you can come back at the end of the year and be like, Colt take, Colt take, L take, L take. Fuck y'all TikTok motherfuckers out there. L take, L take, L take. At the end of the day, like, we're playing a spectrum game here, okay? So three of these hit out of, out of four, feeling good. Five of them hit out of eight, we're feeling pretty good, okay? So that's the way I'm leaning so far. The only one I love the over on is... Drake London because of the opportunity there. Christian Watson, okay? His over-under is at 650. And that's one that you might say, oh, he's got as much opportunity as Traylon Burks does over there in Tennessee. 18th in terms of pass attempts per game. 17th in terms of pass rate. Wouldn't be surprised if we saw that go even more towards the running back position as they develop more trust for A.J. Dillon. And that combo of him and Aaron Jones together, along with just losing Devontae Adams, is going to... Listen, like Aaron Rodgers forced the ball Devonte Adams when he had nothing there, he would he would shove it into two defenders, knowing Devonte Adams would come out of it. This is, I think, this is going to be one of the run heavier teams in the NFL. They lose Adams, they lose MVS, they lose Equinemius St. Brown. Two hundred forty one total targets, fourteen point one targets per game available. Obviously, big opportunity. Sammy Watkins comes in. They also draft Romeo Dubs. I think they might have drafted someone even later in the draft as well. Don't expect like a seventh-round rookie to make an impact, though. Christian Watson comes into a lot of opportunity. I'm still not sure he's a great player. He's still a little bit raw. And when you're a raw 23-, 24-year-old guy, uh, there's some question marks there, okay? And I don't know how long Aaron Rodgers is going to hold out to be, like, excited about that. So, with Watson, I think he's going to be forced into a role that's big enough where like 650, I'd probably hit the over on. But I think a lot of people are going to be looking at this line a little bit fishier. Okay. So the Christian Watson rookie year breakout, like the path to making it happen is extremely fucking obvious. Like we know why it'll happen if it does. It's because all the opportunity in the fucking world is there. But I think it might be a fishy line. I think that's one that looks like sneaky too good to be true. And there's a reason why those lines are set at those. Jahan Dotson is the same line as Christian Watson at 650.5. <sighs> number two, if not the number three behind Logan Thomas, 
And this is an offense that's probably going to want to go run heavy. They did it last year, 21st in terms of pass attempts per game, 25th in terms of pass rate, though. 55.4% of their plays were passes. That's very low. They lose Humphreys and DeAndre Carter, which is only 106 targets, 6.2 targets per game. They bring in Jahan Dotson. Curtis Samuel missed almost all of last year, so he's going to be much more of a factor. Logan Thomas missed a lot of last year, so he's going to be bike on the field, although Ricky Seals-Jones is also gone. So there's a little wish-wash. I don't know you know, how much opportunity is really presented in this offense. They do bring in Brian Robinson, so again, I think they're going to try to establish the fucking run and be a hard-nosed Ron Rivera football team. So this is an offense that I don't know if the opportunity is going to be there. He is a first-round guy, of course, so you think he just immediately gets a starting role. But I think they're going to be splitting targets, again, between Terry McLaurin, Curtis Samuel, Logan Thomas, three running backs, Gibson, Brian Robinson, J.D. McKissick. So if I had to lean the over-under on this one, I would definitely go with the under on Jahan Dotson. But, again, when you're looking at any of these guys, like when we're projecting year one breakouts versus year two, it's extremely different. It's only one year apart, but the values are going to be so different, right? Like Garrett Wilson going into 2023, like – Corey Davis might be gone. Zach Wilson might take his breakout year, like might have stepped up to have his breakout year. So Garrett Wilson right now, we might be a little bit low on him, but he might be like a top 10 dynasty asset come 2023. Chris Olave, same thing. Michael Thomas might be gone. Um, He might have easily came in as a wide receiver two there. Now will be the wide receiver three or wide receiver one. Jameis Winston could have had a really nice year. Like these are things that we're projecting going forward. But for rookie year, year number one, I like the under on a lot of these players sky Moore, you might say what the fuck is he doing at 800 at number two in terms of receiving yardage i say not so motherfucking fast ah, fuck it. i do my best lee corso impression on that because if you look at the numbers one of course tyree kill is gone demarcus robinson gone byron pringle gone we're looking at 260 vacated targets that is 15.2 per game this was second this was an nfl offense that was second in pass attempts per game 40 pass attempts per game, the sixth highest pass rate. They had no success on the ground last year. They had Ronald Jones. They are going to have no success on the ground this year, okay? This is going to be a team that's going to pass and pass and pass and pass. Defense is not their strong point right now. This is an offense that's in a in a division where they're going against the Chargers and Justin Herbert. Derek Carr and the Raiders, who were at least an average offense last year, that added Devontae Adams to the mix. The Broncos added Russell Wilson. This is going to be a high-powered fucking division that they got to play six of their 17 games against. They're going to have to score and score and score and score. They added Juju, who who knows what he is. At this point, he's just a pumped-up slot receiver who hasn't really been good in three years. MVS, who somehow continues to get hyped up every single year. That's literally never returned value. Um, MVS should fucking stand for the most most value sucked. It's the most value sucked out of fucking fantasy players. That's what MVS should honestly stand for. Justin Ross, an undrafted free agent. Who knows if he makes a team. Ronald Jones hasn't caught a ball since fucking 2002. So we're looking at a bunch of... Literally, Juju is the only one that would make me afraid in terms of taking away targets from Sky Moore. Everyone else is either doesn't get targets, might not make the team, or a very specialized player on the outside, MVS. So Sky Moore being in an offense that is wildly pass-heavy, High pass rate, ton of targets available for a guy like him to explode this year. I like the over on Sky Moore. As as tricky as it might sound, as opposite as it might sound to a lot of people, the Sky Moore over on 800.5 receiving yards, I love. George Pickens. 650 feels high for someone who is like the very clear third, if not fourth, if not fifth option in this passing offense, okay? Because Deontay's a clear one. Najee had like 95 targets last year. Pat Fryermuth is going to take a much bigger role as like the clear starting tight end going into this year. Uh, Juju's obviously gone. He didn't really play a role at all last year. This was kind of crazy to me. Was this Is this right, Tony? Are you sure about Pittsburgh? This is going to come as a surprise to a lot of y'all, but Pittsburgh down there on that bottom line, the fourth most pass attempts per game with the second highest pass rate per game. They did not run the ball. I don't really blame them. Like, you might as well. The way they use Najee just as a short dump-off guy, I'd rather that than running the ball. It's more effective, to be honest. So that pass rate, those pass attempts per game, I think will come down a little bit. They'll have Najee a little bit more involved on the ground. But they don't have a ton of departure at the wide receiver position. They do add Calvin Austin also. So George Pickens feels like a guy that we want to invest in based on his talent for the long term. I don't know what his impact is going to be immediately as a rookie. This kind of makes me a little bit nervous, the 650 line here. Because, again, Deontay's the number one. Najee, Pat Frymuth, both heavily involved. 
this is an L for Chase Claypool because George Pickens could just straight up be a better player than Chase Claypool and take his job like halfway through the year and, you know, have him move into like the as a big slot wide receiver and then next year take over. Again, yeah, next year, Deontay might be gone two years. Chase Claypool might like this is something more of a long term investment for me where I don't really expect George Pickens to break out year one. Again, we don't even know what the quarterback situation is. So if I'm slamming an under here. It is going to be George Pickens at 650.5 because he's going to have to earn his way to the wide receiver three role and to wide receiver two role. A lot of obstacles in the way. All right, so that is probably the best breakdown I can give you all of the rookie class, who I expect to break out in year one, who I expect to do sheesh in year one, who I will be putting money on on prize picks, which you all should be doing as well. Head over to prizepicks.com or hit the link down below. We'll take you right to the app store. They got a beautiful app, aesthetic well fucking done and great product over there at prize picks use the promo code bdge when you deposit for the first time and they're gonna match exactly what you put down so if you put down 50 to hit these rookie wide receivers you're gonna have 100 in your account to actually play with okay so i love y'all make sure you hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed subscribe to the channel if you're new and i'll see you tomorrow